I share that young child's concern and confusion. Why would we do this? What would lead us to show such disrespect for those who carry out our policy? All Americans should be confused about why our hardworking public servants would be forced to work without pay or be told to go home and wait while a paycheck doesn't come. It's not just federal employees and contractors who are affected. And by the way, contractors, we're going to repay the federal employees, as we should. But the contractors, the small business people, the small shop owners in my district that have thousands of their customers who aren't being paid and therefore are not customers. One woman from St. Mary's County, the county in which I live, said this, we were scheduled to close on our home on January 11th and received a phone call three days before that we would be not going to closing because our loan was on hold due to the government shutdown. A time that is supposed to be the happiest, and here we sit with our house in boxes and living week to week with a landlord. We don't know if we will lose our home. I would tell Ms. President Trump to listen to these stories. Listen to the humanity that must be in you. Be sympathetic, be empathetic, be caring about these people who are your constituents, whom you are pledged to protect. I would ask the President and Senator McConnell to hear the voices of men and women, their shutdown policies is hurting. You're going to hear many more stories, Mr. President and Senator McConnell. Democrats have voted now 11 times to end this shutdown, and Republicans and the President have blocked these measures again and again. And let me say to the, uh, Madam Speaker, to those who might be listening, we passed Republican bills to open up this government. Not our bills, not partisan bills, Republican Senate passed bills which would have opened up the government. Madam Speaker, because we care so deeply about our constituents who are either worked for or are served by our government, we will continue to do everything possible to reopen government and share the stories of those being held hostage by the President and Senator McConnell. And I thank my colleagues for being on this floor to bring their stories of their constituents, of the President's constituents, to his attention, as well as Senator McConnell. And I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from New York seat recognition? Uh, Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute and to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to call on President Trump and the Senate to reopen the federal government immediately. A legion of federal workers went to work again this morning with no idea how or when they will be able to pay their bills or support their families. Workers like Tracy from my hometown of Amsterdam, New York. Tracy has worked for the USDA for more than three decades, helping upstate New York farmers with nowhere else to turn find the funds they need to stay afloat for another season. She says, when you start to lose farms, equipment dealers go out of business, everybody suffers, the charities, the churches. If you can't pay your bills, you can't go to the local pancake breakfast on Sunday to help a not-for-profit. This weekend, bitter cold hit New York's capital region. Tracy tells me she hasn't gone down to the basement because she's afraid to see the level of heating oil left in her tank. And just as tough as the mental toll this shutdown is taking. Until recently, Tracy was furloughed. Now she's working, working without pay. She worries about the farmers who rely on USDA loans to get seed and fertilizer for the coming season. When asked when, what she would say if she was standing here in this spot today, she said, and quote, we need to take care of one another. It doesn't matter what party you are. We need to help and uplift each other. Madam Speaker, I urge the United States Senate to heed Tracy's call. 
move forward with any one of the many bills that we have passed here in the House to reopen this government, restore paychecks to our dedicated federal workers and the critical services they provide to our neighbors who need it, who need it most. With that, I yield back my remainder time. Thank you. Thank you. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from California seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Today, I went to the Jose Andre Food Bank in Washington, D.C. for federal workers. I was stunned to see hundreds waiting in line in the rain. Inside, they were giving a hot meal to everybody, as well as fresh vegetables, diapers, and feminine products. And they were assisting those who were in danger of missing utility payments. As I served the workers, I asked them what their jobs were. They worked for the FBI, the Department of Justice, and the D.C. Superior Court. And how many of these workers were served by this food bank yesterday? 11,000. They are like the federal workers in my district, people like Catherine who has back problems and now can't afford the copay for physical therapy and epidurals, or Eric who told me he had to defer car maintenance in order to avoid missing his son's college tuition payment. This suffering could end right now. But instead of ending their pain, Trump ignores it. Just this morning, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross said he couldn't understand why furloughed workers have to go to food banks. Well, I say, end this shutdown today. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Florida seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute. Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, this shutdown is causing fear, pain, and stress for thousands of families in Central Florida. Now this may be confusing to the President and to Senator McConnell, but to Brandon and his wife who both have federal jobs in my district and zero income coming in now, it's all too clear. It's all too clear to Raf, an Army veteran who is trying to juggle expenses for three children, including a special needs child. Oh, it's all too clear to Doug, who keeps sensitive equipment working at the airport, but now he's struggling to cover daily expenses while also taking care of his mother. It's all too clear, Madam Speaker, to my constituent Jeff, a Coast Guard retiree, now a civilian employee, who is working to raise money to help current Coast Guard servicemen. But Jeff himself is also not receiving a paycheck. Families like these, and there are hundreds and thousands of them, real people with real pain. The President and Senator McConnell need to do the right thing and put an end to this destructive shutdown now. With that, Madam Speaker, I yield back. Thank you. For what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I ask the unanimous consent to address the House for one minute and to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, I rise today because what our country is going through is a disgrace. 800,000 federal workers are going without a paycheck. They are suffering and their families are suffering all because the president wants a wall that is nothing more than a monument to hate. The American people are tired of this president's games. Last night, I called some constituents who had contacted my office because they are furloughed due to the Trump shutdown. I talked to a Forest Service worker from my district who has missed a paycheck and doesn't want to be used as a bargaining chip by the president. I talked to another constituent who works at the National Archives and is experiencing the consequences of this shutdown, and she knows that the longer this drags on, the more people uh, that will get hurt. And last night, I received a heart-wrenching message from a constituent who is experiencing hardship and needs to apply for assistance programs, but she can't because she can't even access the information she needs from the Office of Personal Management. This has to end. We have voted not once, but not twice, but 11 times to reopen the government. And Leader McConnell and the Senate Republicans have blocked these bills in the Senate every step of the way. The to gentleman's them, time I'll has expired. Enough. Do your jobs, not the president's bidding. 800,000 workers and the rest of the American people demand it. And the so gentleman's do we. time has expired. Members are, to keep the gavel. Members are reminded to heed the gavel. 
For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Pennsylvania seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, I rise to speak on behalf of Megan and Rick and their children from the Pennsylvania 6th. Rick answered the call after 9-11 to join the Air National Guard. He was deployed to Iraq in 2007 and Afghanistan in 2008, and then hired as an air traffic controller on a veteran's preference. Currently, the family's only income is Rick's. In day 34, Megan is now selling items online to try to get their income for their family because they have no idea how long this shutdown will last. She has called their daughter's preschool to see if they can withdraw her and get a refund for the remainder of the school year. She now has an appointment with SNAP this week for food assistance for her and her family. Rick loves his job. He takes pride in what he does, but this is taking a toll on him as well. The family's last-ditch plan is to pull from their 401ks and incur severe penalties to be able to keep a roof over their heads. This tragedy is playing out in household after household in my community. I am a third-generation veteran, and border protection is an imperative and real issue, but shutdown is not the answer. I rise for the people like Megan and Rick because shutting down the government is failed policy. I yield and thank you. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from, I'm sorry, from the, the gentleman from South Carolina seek recognition? I'll seek permission to address the House for one minute and revise and extend. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to ask my Republican colleagues who continue to vote against reopening the government, how do they respond to their constituents who are suffering during this inhumane shutdown? For example, my office was contacted by the wife of a federal corrections officer from South Carolina's third district. Her husband works at the federal prison in Edgefield, and she just had bariatric surgery and is unable to work. She's unable to afford the vitamins her doctor prescribed because they are not covered by insurance. Without these vitamins, she may develop deficiencies that could cause death. To further add to their financial difficulties, her husband, as a correctional officer, was required to sign a document that he would not get another job. They sacrificed a lot to build a good credit score they have, but this shutdown is impacting and their family's finances will be affected well into the future. Again, I ask my colleagues across the aisle, how do you respond to your constituents who are suffering. They need leadership from the President, Leader McConnell, and House Republicans to end the shutdown now. Enough is enough. Thank you. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Pennsylvania seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute and to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, the gentlewoman recognized for one minute. Across my district, the 7th District of Pennsylvania, and across our country, this shutdown is hurting small businesses. One of my constituents is an entrepreneur from Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, and he recently emailed me to let me know that he can't get his mandatory employer ID number for the new business he's trying to start because the IRS is shut down. Until he gets that number, he can't set up payroll for his employees or open a company bank account. Another constituent from Emmaus, Pennsylvania, processes small business administration-backed loans to entrepreneurs trying to start or expand businesses. But as he explains, since the SBA has been shut down, no small business loans have been going out. For many, that means no access to capital at reasonable interest rates, and having to turn to loan sharks to keep businesses afloat. And let us never forget that our Coast Guard is still working without pay. We were sent here to make people's lives better, not to make them harder and more stressful than they already are. Members of both parties need to come together to support the small businesses and our military that power our economy, and that means ending the shutdown. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Texas seek recognition? 
Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, let them eat cake. Marie Antoinette, Secretary of Commerce, has indicated that my $28,000 paid TSO agent can walk into the nation's banks and demand a loan. Well, right now in my district, the city and other good neighbors are opening the doors to give free groceries to those TSOs and other wonderful federal uh, workers. I don't know what bank they can go into. I can tell you that Edith, who just returned from deployment in the Middle East, is suffering. She hasn't, she's worked for 25, hasn't worked for 25 days. To make matters worse, uh, she has to take temporary work in order to help pay uh, for her children. She's now selling personal possessions to make a difference. Sandra, who recently came to Houston to work at NASA, she came to start on January 7th from Nebraska. She hasn't been able to work, she doesn't have a job, and she doesn't have any money. Or what about Linda, who has been working, now has to work extra shifts to help pay for her children. She too is selling her items, rent, groceries, everything that is needed. Let them eat cake. That is what is being said by this administration. Open the government, pay our workers now. Mr. Republican, join us in the 11 times that we have voted to open the government The gentlewoman's now. time has expired. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Virginia seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Over the past 34 days, we have heard that this shutdown is about security. Well, I'm a former undercover CIA officer, so let's talk about security. There is nothing secure about FBI agents working without pay. There is nothing secure about them closing down investigations and losing their informants, their counter-terrorism informants. There is nothing secure about TSA employees who keep us safe in the airspace working without pay. There is nothing secure about our Customs and Border Patrol agents working along the very border we are discussing, working without pay. There is nothing secure about our air traffic controllers working 10 hours a day to keep our airplanes safe in the air. And there is nothing secure about our diplomats working in war zones and around the world to keep this country safe working without pay. There's nothing secure about the 42,000 dedicated members of the U.S. Coast Guard working without pay as they defend our shores. The public servants who work every single day to protect the lives of their fellow American citizens deserve better. And I know this because I used to be one of them. This shutdown is a disgrace. It is hurting our national security. We must end it now so that the Americans can sleep safely at night, federal workers can receive the paychecks they've earned, and our country's military, economic, and diplomatic the strength time can inspired. be preserved before it's too late. Thank you. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Nevada seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I stand here today to share the story of Lori Wall, a Las Vegas resident, a mother of three, and a federal employee denied a paycheck because of this government shutdown. Like many of Nevada's federal employees, Lori is still reporting to work every single day, doing her job on behalf of the American people. But because she's not getting paid, Lori has to also add trips to the local food bank to pick up needed food and diapers for her family. Because of this shutdown, 3,520 Nevada-based federal employees are being denied a paycheck. 30,000 Southern Nevadans are at risk of homelessness because of reduced housing assistance, and 34,000 people in my district could lose their nutritional assistance. The House has already voted 11 times to reopen the government. It's long past time that the Senate do the same and stop holding Nevadans like War Lori Wall hostage. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Colorado seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Uh, Madam Speaker, here we are, fifth week of this shutdown, and I want to talk about two stories. One is Tyler. 
He is a resident of Golden, Colorado, known his family a long time. He told, he's got two small children. He says, uh, two weeks ago, I received a certificate from the United States of America thanking me for working for the air traffic controllers for 10 years. Same day, I got a check for zero dollars. Then I want to talk about a young woman who works for the EPA, two children with disabilities. She's a patriot. She has a chemistry degree. She could work in a million different places. She wanted to work for us, for the United States of America, to serve the public, to give back to the United States. But now she's got a question with two young kids with disabilities whether she can do this anymore. She expected us to be reliable as employers, and we're not. We're better than this, Mr. President. Open up the government. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Every day I hear from constituents about how this manufactured crisis is hurting themselves and hurting their families. Mitch McConnell and President Trump's refusal to reopen government has consequences, consequences for real people. A Marine veteran from Bay City, Michigan, won't receive his monthly housing allowance this week that he needs to pay, used to pay his rent and make his car payments. His words to me were this, and I quote, I never thought the president would be putting us veterans that he says he loves so much in harm's way just to get money for his harebrained immigration solution. That's from a United States veteran who served this country and is now being treated by the President of the United States as a pawn in a political game to get something that he's not willing to submit to the legislative process. Shame on this President. Shame on him. Open this government. Do it now. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Pennsylvania seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. I rise today to commend the good people of the 5th District of Pennsylvania who are helping their neighbors, the federal workers, contractors, and families who've been so grievously impacted by the government shutdown. As the human and financial toll of this senseless shutdown has spread, we've seen locals step up and help those who are struggling without pay. What a contrast with this administration, where a cabinet member said today that he didn't understand why an unpaid worker might have to resort to a food bank to feed his family. Unlike this administration and the Senate Majority Leader, our neighbors have recognized the true impact of the shutdown and are doing something about it. We've seen youth groups and fire departments and local organizations organize food drives. Nonprofits are collecting donations and organizing food pantries so federal workers can feed their families. I urge the President and the Senate Majority Leader to put people before politics. People are not bargaining chips. The shutdown needs to end now. For what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? one minute and to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, the time has come for the President to end this shutdown and put our federal workers above political bickering. Hundreds of thousands of federal workers, many of them veterans, continue to show up to work every day without pay. TSA employees, FBI employees, air traffic controllers, Coast Guardsmen and women, as well as many others, continue to make the security and safety of our nation a top priority. One such person that I spoke to is Lupi Mejia. Lupi is a veteran who currently works for the FBI on counterterrorism issues. Her husband also works for the FBI, and neither one of them is getting paid. During this shutdown, Lupi has been going to food banks to keep food costs down. Paying the bills has become a struggle, and she's trying to do this all without dipping into their family savings, but it's getting harder and harder each day. 
Mr. President, your shutdown is causing hardship to families like Lupe's all across this nation. 34 days is long enough. Let's do what is right and pay our federal employees, especially those who put their lives on the line for our country. Oops. They deserve to be compensated for the work they do and the security they provide. Let's bring sanity back to government, and I call on the president to end this useless shutdown. I yield back my time. And from New Mexico, seek recognition. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, the pain from this Trump shutdown is being felt deeply in every corner of my district in New Mexico and across America. We have farmers and ranchers that are unable to plan for their production. Tribal communities are facing disruptions in their health care services. People are not getting urgent questions answered by the IRS, and some families are worried that there's going to be liens put on their homes. A local health clinic in my district, the Pecos Valley Medical Center, had their federal loan halted, even though the project's been approved, which means they can't draw down on funds. This means they will have to pause their efforts to expand access to mental health care and could jeopardize the project. All this while 800,000 families, individuals across America are not being paid. Over 150,000 veterans that are furloughed, some of them working without being paid. Chef Jose Andres feeding thousands of people that are lining up just down the street between here and the White House. Mr. President, come outside, go see what Chef is doing. These families are hurting. End this shutdown. It can end today. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from California seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, I was elected to fight for the people of my district, to challenge the way things are done here in Washington and make sure our government starts working for the people. But it can't work for the people when it's not working at all. It's not working for Christie, a hardworking, air traffic controller, veteran, and single mother of two who is terrified that when she doesn't get her paycheck tomorrow, she won't be able to feed her kids. She works a good job. She shouldn't be afraid of meeting her kids' basic needs, and now she's looking for a job at night as a bartender. It's not working for Eric, a 17-year career employee at the Federal a Aviation Agency. He wrote to me, as an integral part of the nation's air traffic control system, my focus has always been and will always be on safety. That's true for so many of the law enforcement officials, aviation specialists, and firefighters who are affected by this shutdown. They're focusing on safety, on our safety, and in return, they are not receiving pay for their work. Every day, that safety becomes more and more compromised. It's not working for Diane, who works for the Angeles National Forest and lives paycheck to paycheck, as almost 80% of this country does. She's gearing up for the economic turmoil of not getting a second paycheck tomorrow. It's not working for John, who protects us as a federal prison guard from terrorists, who's now driving Uber and his shifts, er, after his shifts to pay the bills. So I ask my colleagues, Mr. President and the, our fellow senators, to open the expired. White House right now, to open the government right now. For what purpose back. does the gentleman from Massachusetts seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, this morning, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, the Marie Antoinette of the Trump administration, said, and I quote, he doesn't understand why federal workers need to go to food banks. Oh, my God. He might as well have said, let them eat cake. This president and his cabinet are so out of touch, it is pathetic. Here are just a few emails I've gotten this week. A law enforcement officer in my district says, we struggle but pinch pennies so our child can attend a good school. My mortgage company put us, on, put us in no pay status. The shutdown is putting us at risk of losing our home. A Customs and Border Patrol employee says, we have bills to pay like nursery school and daycare. What's going to happen to us? I'm sick over this. A Fish and Wildlife Service uh, worker writes, I'm proud to serve the American public, but right now I can't even serve my family dinner. Madam Speaker, President Trump's publicity stunt is hurting America's hardworking public servants. It is cruel. Shame on him. And shame on Leader McConnell for refusing to end this sh shutdown. He, along with the President, need to grow up. They need to do their job, and they need to reopen this government now. 
Members are reminded to refrain from engaging in personalities towards the president. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Georgia seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. At its most basic level, the government should keep us safe. On the 34th day of the longest government shutdown in our nation's history, hundreds of thousands of federal workers tasked with keeping us safe are working without pay. As the men and women of TSA, air traffic control, the FBI, and the United States Coast Guard, and many other government agencies continue to perform their duties, many live with uncertainty and fear of not knowing how they're going to pay their mortgage or feed their families. In less than two weeks, millions will flood into Atlanta, Georgia, where I represent, and they'll be flooding in for the Super Bowl. And having been a flight attendant for 30 years, I am very afraid. I'm deeply concerned for the Atlanta airport's TSA agents and air traffic controllers and for the federal agencies tasked with ensuring the public safety during this event. President Trump said he'd shut down the government for a wall that he claims will make us safer, but in fact, his shutdown has made us less safe. I will continue, along with my Democratic colleagues, to continue to support bipartisan funding packages to reopen the, reopen, reopen the government. I yield back my, my time. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Florida seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute. Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, I want to share the story of Doris, a constituent from Palmetto Bay, Florida. Doris works as an investigative program officer for the Department of Homeland Security. For over 27 years, she's devoted her life to the safety and the security of our community. Today marks the 34th day of this irresponsible shutdown. It also marks the 34th day that Doris will be going to work without getting a paycheck. She has received notice that her department will miss a second pay period, something that her supervisor has told her will affect her retirement status. This nightmare has affected her financially, mentally, and emotionally. She's terrified about having to default on her mortgage and not having enough money to cover her car payments or put food on the table. Later today, Doris is planning to stand in line at a nearby parking lot to receive a head of lettuce and some tomatoes from a local food bank. Is this what the administration thought of when they initiated this shutdown? Is this what the greatest country in the world has succumbed to? It angers me to know that Doris is being used as a pawn to fulfill a campaign promise. Mr. President, we've done our job. You do yours. Open the government. For what purpose does the gentlelady from California seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, across this country and in my hometown of Sacramento, President Trump is inflicting unnecessary harm to our federal workers, our economy, and the health and safety of the American people. I have heard from my constituents across my district that this shutdown is disrupting their lives. Many federal workers are frustrated. You know, they just want to return to work, yet now they can't work or they're working without pay, they can't pay their bills, and the consequences of this shutdown affects us all. I've heard from a U.S. Coast Guard veteran who answered the call to serve his country for over 20 years and retired with honors. Now, because of the shutdown, his pension isn't being processed. He's worried about his bills and heartbroken that this country he served for so many years is not honoring his promise to take care of him in return. Another person who is a TSA agent working without pay at Sacramento's airport says it's hard to concentrate at work. When she's thinking about the bills stacking up, she's able to pay for January's rent with savings. But if this shutdown continues through February, she'll not have enough money for rent, leaving her to choose between being evicted or moving out on her own and becoming homeless. Our federal workers deserve an employer that honors his promises and provides for its workforce. It's time for President Trump and Leader McConnell to fully fund the government and put an end to the pain and suffering of the American people. I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Nevada seek recognition? Uh, to address the House for one minute and revise and extend my remarks. 
Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Ms. Speaker. On behalf of the people of Nevada's third district, I rise again to say it's time to end this shutdown. My office is currently wor working with a couple, both of them federal workers, one of them a veteran who are furloughed and now being evicted because of this unnecessary shutdown. Nevada's SNAP and Housing Authority are preparing to draw on their reserves to make up for the lack of federal funding. Over 400,000 Nevadans will face devastating consequences if these programs run out of money. Our governor just asked our Higher Education Board to step in and protect Nevada's college students from penalties, and the Speaker of our legislature just introduced a bill to protect federal workers from debt collectors and landlords. Get the picture? We're now stressing our state and local governments because our President and our Senate cannot step up and do their job. The shutdown has gone on far too long. My colleagues and I just voted 11th time to reopen the government. I ask the Senate and the President to do their duty and open it up now. Thank you. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from New York seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker. Federal workers should not have to struggle to pay their bills just because my colleagues across the aisle and the President refuse to end the Trump shutdown. They should not be in a position of having to apply for unemployment while continuing to work without pay, which is exactly what one of my constituents from Westchester County, New York, has been forced to do. Others in my district, nonprofit employees working reduced hours because of the shutdown, have been forced to rely on food donations to feed their families. It is inexcusable that Republicans have rejected 11 opportunities to end the Trump shutdown, pay workers, reopen government. I urge them to come to their senses, reopen government without further delay. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from, California, um, from Illinois seek recognition? I seek unanimous consent to address the House for one minute. Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. A week ago, we had a uh, roundtable in my district, and we invited, including Madam Speaker today, um, to come and listen to the workers. Tamara, who works for the Commodity Future Tra uh, Trading, Com Trading Commission, said that She's trying to figure out how to tell her son that he's not going to be able to have his birthday party. She is a young widow, single mother. Veronica said that she has to take care of her parents and has to pay for their medicines and their co-pays, and it's really hard. Lori said that workers at the IRS are trying to figure out how to pay for gas to get to work, parking, and child care, and the Taxpayer Assistance Office is closed, even though we have a new tax bill. Kevin said the um, morale at the Bureau of Prisons is really tough. He lives 50 miles from work and is just about out of gas money. Crystal said that um, we're public servants, we are not public slaves. And Florence, who helps people get food stamps, is applying for them herself and waited three hours at a food pantry. We need to get rid of the shutdown and pay the workers now. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from California seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to echo the pain and suffering experienced by federal workers and their families in my district during this reckless McConnell-Trump shutdown, and also the important work that they do as public employees. One is a constituent who is a proud African-American TSA agent out of the Oakland airport who has been working without pay for more than a month. He must pay to get to work, though, buy his own lunch and gas, but has no paycheck coming in. He can't borrow from his family because eight of his relatives also work for the federal government. His story resonates with so many African Americans who work for the federal government. By now, this shutdown, the black community has been deeply affected, like everyone else. While African Americans account for 12% of the population, 18% of the workforce is African American. 
This is, of course, due to discrimination against African Americans in the private sector. The federal government has provided good paying jobs and a path into the middle class. My grandfather worked for the Postal Service. He was a letter carrier. My mother worked for Social Security. Another constituent has been furloughed from the Food and Drug Administration. He told me that he and his husband both rely on their incomes to afford rent on their one bedroom apartment. I urge President Trump and Senator McConnell to stop playing games with people's lives. Let's reopen the government and get workers the paychecks that they deserve. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey seek recognition? Address the House, Madam Speaker, for one minute. With unanimous consent. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, 34 days into the Trump shutdown, New Jersey families are hurting. 5,000 federal workers have lost their paycheck. Millions more are being harmed by the closure of critical services. In my district in Edison, many EPA employees are being prevented from doing their jobs. These dedicated public servants help clean up contaminated sites. They keep our drinking water safe. Meanwhile, the NOAA lab at Sandy Hook, they're unable to conduct urgent research on climate change. One of my EPA workers said, and I quote, Mr. President, please open the government. Do your job so we can do our job. And I couldn't agree more. Members of the Coast Guard at Sandy Hook in my district are going without pay. These are the men and women who risk their lives to keep us safe during Superstorm Sandy, and they deserve a paycheck. An IRS worker from my district said, and this is a quote, this is the first time in my life that I have never had to go to a food bank for food. Not knowing where food is coming from is scary. And she went on to say that she fears being evicted from her apartment. This is an IRS worker. Madam Speaker, House Democrats have voted 11 times on bipartisan legislation. It's time to open the government, Mr. President. For what purpose the gentlewoman from Michigan seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. I rise today for the people suffering the consequences of this shutdown. I rise today for our great country and for the belief in our great government. I rise for our neighbors, our friends, and for all our taxpayers. The impact of this unprecedented shutdown, the longest in our history, has had real and deeply concerning impacts on our families, particularly in Michigan. It is also posing serious threats to our national security and safety. Tim Mock of Waterford, Michigan, a professional aviation safety specialist, has been working diligently throughout this shutdown. He is doing the best he can with the materials he has to ensure our airplanes are safe, but he is unable to access the parts for the planes that are damaged. The longer this shutdown drags on, the more dire these types of operations become. For the well-being of our public servants and the safety of our country, the government must open today. I rise today from this body as this voice imploring the less than 600 among us who have been elected to this federal government to open this government now. What purpose does the gentlewoman from Delaware seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, on this, the 34th day of the longest government shutdown in American history, I sat down with a group of air traffic controllers in my office today. These workers told me about how an already stressful job has been made even worse by this shutdown that many of them are working six days a week, 10 hours a day with no pay. They know that their work requires no mistakes because it's life and death. But to make matters even worse, 30% of them are already stretched thin and currently are eligible to retire. And many are considering retiring earlier so that they can at least get a paycheck. In the words of Renika, one of the air traffic controllers, this shutdown is the perfect storm for a national emergency. Madam Speaker, the collateral damage of this shutdown is difficult to fathom, but this much is clear. Every day that goes by, we are less safe, our economy is more weakened, and all Americans from all backgrounds suffer. This must end. Open the government. Madam Speaker, I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We are now in day 34 of the longest shutdown in American history. Over the course of this shutdown, I've heard from hundreds of people in my community who are being hurt by this reckless shutdown. 
Today I'd like to share the story of Graciela, who wrote to me from my hometown of Redlands. Graciela has worked for the IRS for over 40 years, and her federal job allows her to care for her daughter, who is suffering from thyroid cancer. Graciela wrote to me and said, each missed paycheck is another two weeks that my daughter will go without medication and treatment. It's outrageous that in the face of this type of suffering, real human suffering, our president can remain so callous. We voted 11 times to reopen this government, but instead of working with us to end the shutdown, the president and leader McConnell continue to move the goalposts and insist on funding for their ineffective and wasteful border wall and cuts to legal immigration. Our country deserves better than leaders who are willing to hold their, their people hostage. Graciela concluded her message to me by saying this, the president's misconceived notion that this country needs a wall more than its own citizens need to go back to work or be paid for the work they are doing is mind boggling. Americans are an, suffering and deserve better. Thank you and I yield back. Members are reminded to refrain from engaging in personalities towards the president. For what purpose does the gentleman from Maryland seek recognition? necessary to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, I rise to demand, to insist, to beseech President Trump to end this shutdown now and open the federal government. I represent the fifth largest number of federal government employees. Every day I see, I hear, and I feel the pain and suffering of the federal government employees and contractors in my neighborhoods and by communities. One out of every 10 residents in my Maryland district live in a household headed by a federal government employee or contractor. This Monday, at a community event supporting our federal employees, I met a woman with her two-month-old infant child. She's an essential employee at the Food and Drug Administration. She needs to be and wants to be on the job, but she simply can't. She can't because she can't afford to pay for child care for her infant daughter. She's having difficulty paying for groceries, providing lunch money for her two elementary school age boys and is on the verge of not being able to pay either her rent or her car note. She was sobbing uncontrollably. She was weeping painfully and pleading for you, Mr. President, to open the government, to let her work with dignity, to support her children, and to do her job. President Trump, end this shutdown now. I yield back. Members are reminded to direct their remarks to the chair. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania seek recognition? For one minute, Madam Speaker, speak to the House. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, it's day 34 of the Trump shutdown. Tomorrow will mark the second missed paycheck for 800,000 federal workers and for many federal contractors as well. I've spent parts of two days at the Philadelphia airport meeting with the workers and seeing the needs. These people and groups are stepping up. Everyone is looking to the Republicans and the President to step up. We must reopen this government. Pay these workers now. 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 I yield back to balance my time. Thank you, Madam Speaker. For what purpose does the gentle lady from Virginia seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My district in Northern Virginia is home to tens of thousands of federal workers and even more contractors who work alongside them. I've heard from hundreds of constituents about how the shutdown has turned their lives upside down. Like Teresa, who is a furloughed federal worker. She and her husband recently sold their home and signed a contract to purchase another one in my district. The mortgage financing for their purchase was all set and approved before the shutdown. Their closing date is set for next Monday, the 28th, four days from now. But just a couple days ago, they learned that the mortgage company is now denying their mortgage application because she is furloughed. She was told by the lender that they consider her unemployed and too much of a risk to finance. This is a federal employee who will receive back pay when the shutdown eventually ends. 
But that isn't enough for the mortgage company. It isn't enough for any of their other creditors. And now she and her family, instead of celebrating moving into their new home, are essentially homeless, all because of the reckless Trump-McConnell shutdown. Madam Speaker, I yield back my time. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from California seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Today, thousands of air traffic controllers, who we know are essential to our safety and work in one of the most stressful work environments, have had to work without being paid for 34 days. Unions for air traffic controllers, pilots, and flight attendants released a letter today describing the impact of this shutdown. This is what they wrote, and I quote, we have a growing concern for the safety and security of our members, our airlines, and the traveling public due to the government shutdown. This is already the longest government shutdown in the history of the United States, and there is no end in sight. In our risk-averse industry, we cannot even calculate the level of risk currently at play. Nor predict the point at which the entire system will break. It is unprecedented. This is unconscionable. Mr. President, you took credit uh, for this shutdown. You said you would accept the responsibility. You said you own this shutdown. Are you going to own and take responsibility for the loss of lives, for a catastrophe that will be caused in the sky because you're holding the American people hostage for a political agenda that has no credibility whatsoever? I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from New York seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Speaker, it is time to end this shutdown, which is hurting working Americans and damaging the overall economy. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce says that the shutdown is harming the American people, American business, and the economy. So far, it has cost the United States economy about a half percentage point of overall economic growth. That's about $25 billion. J.P. Morgan Chase estimates that the shutdown is now reducing economic output up to $10 billion each week. Even the administration has doubled its estimate of the economic costs. It says that if the shutdown lasts through March, we could have zero growth this quarter. Some forecasters even project that growth could turn negative. Mr. President, open this government for the people. The people are hurting. Enough is enough. For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? I ask for unanimous consent to address the House for one minute. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Mr. President, America is in crisis. What will it take for you to reopen the government? Will it take families across America to not get their tax return? Will it take federal employees going without a second paycheck or without health care? Will it take millions of families who are going hungry without SNAP, without food assistance? Maybe it'll take Custom and Border Patrol walking off the job or uninspected planes falling from the sky due to mechanical failure or worse. I have here a letter from Doug Lowe, one of my constituents who is an aviation specialist, and he talks about how these planes aren't even being inspected right now. Or we're even worse, for all your bragging about the economy, we could be going into a recession in what would otherwise be a boom period. So I ask again, President Trump, what will it take, what disaster will it take for you to reopen this government now? For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Texas seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, I rise today on behalf of federal employees in my district and around the nation. 
for over a month now, 800,000 Coast Guardmen, TSA agents, and air traffic controllers have been held hostage by President Trump's shutdown, a shutdown with far-reaching consequences. Due to staffing shortages at the Dallas's two major airports have resulted in shortages from the TSA agents being forced to live the last 34 days without pay. Aviation experts have warned that flying today is less safe than over a month ago. Madam Speaker, since President Trump irresponsibly shut government down, I've heard from countless TSA agents and the National Air Traffic Controllers in my district. They have all indicated that while they are committed to their duties, they're also suffering financially and need the government reopen now. I stand with them. Every member of our caucus are standing together, calling on the White House to open the government now. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from the Virgin Islands seek recognition? I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute and to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Thank you. I also rise to share a shutdown story from my district in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Vanessa Thomas, a resident of St. Thomas, shared a heartfelt story with me on her personal experience with the government shutdown. In 2017, less than two years ago, she lost her home in the two hurricanes that we had. Her home insurance is through the USDA Rural Development Program. Prior to the shutdown, she did not receive homeowners insurance payments regularly. Now, with the shutdown, she is forced to use her own money to pay for materials and labor to repair her home. She has to choose between having her daughter sit out a semester in college or to saving her home. This is one among many stories that are threatening residents of our country. Today, I strongly urge the president to end this shutdown now, immediately. Today, we cannot continue using federal employees and federal funds as pawns in a political game. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Oklahoma seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, I rise today to address the devastating impacts this shutdown is having on families throughout Oklahoma's 5th District. Over the Martin Luther King holiday weekend, I went back to my district and visited with impacted federal workers. The stories of the impacts were heartbreaking. And one of the things that stuck with me was speaking with a woman named Tammy who reminded me that it is not just the government that is shuttered right now, but families' lives who are being shattered. And that is too often the forgotten part of this conversation. We should never use federal employees, contractors, or their families as pawns in a political disagreement. So while we are analyzing the current negative effects of this shutdown, we also need to look at the long-lasting effects on families, on our communities, and the economy. Simply put, we will be suffering the negative consequences of this shutdown for years to come. And the stories I have heard from Oklahoma families are the reasons I will continue to work to reopen the government. Thank you. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from California seek recognition? No? Consent to address the House for one minute and to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, the gentlewoman Thank is you. recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise uh, following our 11th vote earlier today to reopen government and end the senseless chaos and the pain of this shutdown. Why won't the Republicans take yes for an answer? Why don't, won't they provide relief for the hardworking Americans suffering in their own communities? Important to note, Madam Speaker, uh, that on every occasion we have presented uh, to the floor initiatives that have been passed by the Republicans. Uh, in the Senate, just their own bills, sending them back to them, and they have said no. 
or their bills acted upon by a bipartisan group in the House, our most recent contribution uh, to send over to the Senate, and they have said no. And today, in the simplest, the simplest of resolutions, we said, please vote yes for $12 billion for disaster assistance. We all know that we have to do that. And two weeks, open up the government for two weeks in order to have a discussion of how best to protect our borders. And they said no. $12 billion for disaster assistance, two weeks of opening up government to allow the debate to continue while people who are, can come to work and those who are working already, all of them can be paid. Americans uh, like Brenda from Maine, whose family can no longer pay for heating for fuel this winter while temperatures remain below freezing. Americans like Julie from rural Iowa, who says that farmers already are hit hard by tariffs, will feel the squeeze even more now. Americans like Sarah from Colorado, whose new job at the VA is on hold, adding to wait times for veterans who need health care services. And may say of veterans who compose nearly a third of our federal workforce, 31%, our veterans who have security clearances, who are at risk, which are at risk uh, when you can lose your security clearance if you lose your credit rating. And you can lose your credit rating if you cannot pay your bills on time, your mortgage, your rent, your uh, car payment, your uh, credit card bills and the rest. Credit rating goes down your, the vulnerability of your security uh, clearance goes down, it is increased. So it is uh, harmful to our veterans to be doing this and it's important for everyone to know how they are affected because our veterans who have donned the uh, uniform of our country to protect us and then carry on their commitment to public service in the public sector as federal employees, uh, in some ways still continuing to protect us, in other ways meeting our needs in another way. All of them affected by this shutdown. Or like Lily from Georgia who says, food stamp recipients will go hungry, Ma many will lose subsidized housing, state and local services will be overwhelmed trying to make up for the losses. As one woman, Vivian from Maine asked, how is a wall more important than families? The sense of shutdown shows the American people's safety and security is in peril. This week, FBI agents released a report warning of dire effects of the shutdown on nearly every aspect of their work. They write, the FBI writes, we don't need funds to get drugs and guns off the, we don't have funds to get drugs and guns off the street and to prosecute the violent gang and drug traffickers. We aren't able to take child sexual exploitation cases to grand juries to seek indictments and warrants in order to get our most violent offenders arrested. This just puts our children in jeopardy. We have no funds to pay sources that provide cybersecurity intelligence to protect the country against our foreign adversaries. And they conclude, the fear during this disastrous shutdown is our enemies know they can run freely. The FBI talked about children, putting our children in jeopardy. Uh, this shutdown is putting so many children in the families of our federal workers in jeopardy as well. Those of us who have had the privilege of serving those in food lines and the rest, to listen and hear their stories, uh, can tell you firsthand uh, that this is taking an impact that is material for sure, it's about their financial security, but psychological as well. We're doing serious damage to our country, totally unnecessarily. The president and the Republicans either do not notice or do not care about the real effects of this shutdown on real people. They say, oh, you'll get paid later. Well, they have to pay their bills on time and not sometime later. This morning, when told that many federal workers were going to food banks, Treasury Secretary Wilbur Ross said, 
I don't quite understand why. As hundreds of thousands of workers are about to miss a second paycheck tomorrow. Secretary Ross does not know why people without an, a paycheck have to go to food lines. This Marie Antoinette attitude of let them eat cake is pervasive in the administration. The president thinks, I guess, they can call their dads uh, for money. Hours after Secretary Ross made his statement, White House economic advisor Larry Kudlow doubled down on this administration's let them eat cake attitude, saying that the shutdown was just a glitch. Just a glitch? Maybe to you it's a glitch, but it's a paycheck to America's, our, our federal employees and the work they do for us. So they are being harmed by not getting paid. The people they serve, the American people, are being harmed by not being served. Our economy uh, will suffer a downturn. It does at these times. Your own, the president's own economic advisors can tell them that. The shutdown is not a glitch. It is a crisis that the president alone created and that the president alone can end. Now, the Republicans in the Congress have been accomplices uh, to the president's irresponsibility and just ignoring the consequences of his action. Either he doesn't know or he doesn't care. But nonetheless, the Trump shutdown goes on. Once again, we call on the president and the Republicans in Congress, especially in the United States Senate, where they're holding this up, to reopen government now for the sake of the health, the safety, and the well-being of the American people. And I thank our federal employees for what they do to meet the needs of the American people, for the role they play in providing the promise, private, public sector promise that we make to people uh, to meet their needs, uh, to provide the services of the courts, uh, the uh, protections uh, of, our of our security in terms of the FBI, of TSA, of the Coast Guard. Because of this, down, uh, this shutdown, the Coast Guard are the only defense entity that are not being paid. Because this is a 25% shutdown, 75% of the workforce is at work. The Department of Defense is at work. But the Department of Homeland Security is not, and that's where the Coast Guard, that's where, what the Coast Guard falls under. Imagine those responsible for search and rescue in emergency situations having to go to food banks to get food for their families. How does that keep them as strong as they can possibly be, as strong as they can possibly be to search and rescue and to protect us? They are a line of defense in securing our borders. A lot of the discussion is about secure borders. Well, our borders extend to the seas and our Coast Guard, our line of defense there. And in our proposals uh, for the uh, opening up of government, we have funding for our Coast Guard uh, for assets that they have asked us for. So this is uh, it's a tragedy in so many respects. It shouldn't go on any longer. We should at least be able to discuss, discuss and compare the merits of our different proposals and we should be able to do that with government open and not holding the American people hostage, federal employees hostage, the security of our people hostage as well, and the safety and well-being of our children hostage to an idle campaign applause line that the president seems committed to at this time. With that, Madam Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlewoman yields back.
Speakers announced policy of January 3rd, 2019. The gentlewoman from Maine, Ms. Pingree, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the majority leader. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased we're able to be here tonight to have an hour with some of my colleagues to continue this conversation about the hardships people are facing due to this shutdown and the impact it's having on our country. Uh, we've had so many interesting stories and tragic uh, recollections of exactly what people are going through. And as our uh, Speaker, Speaker Pelosi just said, uh, we're holding federal employees hostage. We're holding the safety of our country hostage. Um, we're holding the American people hostage. And it's time to uh, get the government going again and resolve our differences. I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on the subject of my special order. Without objection. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So today is the 34th day of the longest government shutdown in history. It's a shutdown that has no excuse and has taken a great toll on dedicated public servants and their families across America. Americans who have jobs are actually standing in line at food pantries here in Washington and back home in my state of Maine. This chamber, as of today, has voted 11 times to fund the government, to pay 800,000 workers, and to restart essential services. President Trump's unwillingness to reopen the government is tone deaf to the financial circumstances of working Americans. Most are living paycheck to paycheck and pay mortgages and health care premiums and need to keep food on the table. Government workers and contractors cannot afford these weeks being held hostage. People who rely on government programs like SNAP and housing vouchers are feeling the stress. They cannot afford these weeks of being held hostage. Businesses that are losing opportunities to expand and grow their businesses cannot afford these three weeks of being hostage. The consequences of this shutdown have rippled through our state and national economies. Members of Maine's Coast Guard, who protect us every single day, are about to miss their second paycheck while actively serving to protect our working waterfronts. The USDA's partial closure in Maine has put Maine farmers in a financial limbo and SNAP benefits for Maine's most vulnerable are on the verge of a lapse. Many of Maine's crafts, craft brewers, who added $260 million to our state economy of last year, have had to put new products and their businesses on hold. At this time, I just want to share a few of the stories about what's happening and what we're hearing from our constituents in Maine as a result of this shutdown. I'll read just a few clips from letters I've received, the stories Mainers have shared with the local news, and I'll outline some of the broader problems this historic shutdown has created for real people. We've heard from a brewery in the process of expanding to a second location. They've had all their paperwork in and the alcohol and tobacco and tr tax and trade rack, um, with the alcohol and tobacco tax and trade bureau in the Department of Treasury when the shutdown began. But now that brewer's waiting with an empty storefront. Another brewery is just waiting for approval to open six new types of beer, all sitting and ready to be sold. As the owner says, January is already a tough time in Maine, as I hope you know, and to lose out on weeks of sales because of the shutdown may cause us to close our doors. Please, I implore you, do what you can to get the shutdown over with. We hear from a lot of federal employees in our state. Here's one that says, please do whatever you can to reopen the government. I have 28 years of federal service and do not appreciate my financial security being jeopardized by the president. Another says, please do everything you can to help end the government shutdown. As a furloughed federal employee, the anxiety of not knowing when or if I'll be paid grows with every day of the shutdown. I have savings to cover a few months of living expenses, but I know many in this situation don't. We just want to get back to work and we don't want to be used as pawns. Another says, I'm exempted from furlough and I'm mandated to work without pay. This shutdown is crushing me. 
I'm a single father of three who just went from a one-income household to a no-income household. I keep hearing the president insist that federal workers support this. I must have missed that poll. No one has asked me for my input. Please help end this shutdown soon. This is not sustainable for me. Another says, this shutdown is the worst one that I've been involved with since joining the federal government decades ago. Earlier this week, I went to my credit union to take out a personal loan to pay my bills. It's the first time ever in my life I've had to do that. Another says, I work under a government contract and I've just been informed that I cannot come back to work until this government shutdown is over. This is a terrible time of year for myself and my fellow co-workers to not know when we can continue our work, not that there is ever a good time for a shutdown. Well, the good news is I have a lot more stories like this, but I want to share some of the time with my colleagues and um, I will get back to reading them more. So I want to yield um, some time to Ms. Underwood from Illinois. Ohio. Thank you. Illinois. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This week we voted for the 10th time to end the shutdown. For people in the 14th District of Illinois, the effects of this Trump shutdown are real and they are painful. This weekend, I visited a family shelter for survivors of domestic violence that does incredible work serving my community. This shelter would like to expand to serve even more people, but funding uncertainty around reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act make that impossible for them. Domestic violence survivors are a casualty of the shutdown. This weekend, I also met an entrepreneur who is working to open a pet care company with her husband. He even left his job so that they could realize their dream. But they're currently waiting on a small business administration loan they need to open their business. It's sitting on a furloughed worker's desk. Entrepreneurs are a casualty of the shutdown. This week, I met with air traffic controllers in my district, people who keep passengers and freight moving safely through the skies. They are working six-day weeks and about to miss a second paycheck. They told me they look after their colleagues by asking, how long do you have left? How long do they have left before they miss a mortgage payment, a health care bill, or max out their credit cards? These are hardworking, responsible people, many with at least three months savings, but they're entering their second month without a paycheck. The financial and psychological stress of this shutdown is cruel, and sadly, it won't be the only consequence. The shutdown has closed the Air Traffic Controller Training Academy, which will diminish the pipeline of people we need to keep air travel safe and efficient in the future. Our future is a casualty of the Trump shutdown. Madam Speaker, I sincerely hope our Republican colleagues will join us in reopening the government. The alternative is too painful for too many. I yield back my time. Uh, well, thank you very much for your thoughts, and I'm happy to yield uh, whatever time he'd like to speak to my friend from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter. Well, and I thank my friend from Maine, and uh, this subject is so serious and so infuriating because it's absurd. Uh, we have shut down our government. We're like the only country in the world that does something like this and inflict harm on our employees, on Americans and on America. We've had a gentlelady I see here from Virginia is in the chamber. She talked about national security being placed at risk. The, the fact that we've done this to ourselves is uh, really difficult. And I would just say to the president, uh, Madam Speaker, that it's time to reopen this government. We've offered 11 versions of how to reopen the government. But I want to talk about some stories because the psychological effect that the gentlelady from Maine talked about really has an impact on these employees. And I want to talk about a young man who works um, for the uh, uh, National Park Service. He's in the Natural Resource Technical Division. So what he does is he goes to the national parks and deals with faults and different kinds of uh, geological problems that may exist. And they work throughout the year, but particularly at the time when 
uh, it is, the parks are not very crowded. And this is something that is very important. He's worked for the uh, Park Service for 19 years, and then all of a sudden, he believes that nobody saw this coming, and he's furloughed with young children. And he described it as this. He doesn't know when we're going to get back to normal. Everything's on hold. It just sucks. The mental side is crushing. I'm sad, I'm angry, I'm demoralized. And it, this sitting around just twiddling your thumbs, hoping that the greatest nation on earth opens back up for business, eats away at my soul. He's got a brother-in-law that works for the Border Patrol. He is an EMT and a field agent with four children. He's a first responder not getting paid. And this gentleman, we ask him to provide border security, and he's not getting paid, and he's under the pressure of having a young family that needs these paychecks and needs stability and reliability. We had folks from the Fish and Wildlife that came in and talked to us. Deals with aquatic and invasive species like the zebra mussel, which really can gum up water systems throughout the country. There was a big conference of Canada and the, United, the Western United States. That got canceled when in fact we should be making sure these rivers and our, our uh, waterways are in good shape, they're getting affected. There are so many things. We talk about the front-facing individuals that talk to the public, the TSA, the uh, FBI, uh, those individuals, but we have so many other employees who provide service to each and every one of us that are either working without pay or have been furloughed without any and in sight. This is no way to run a nation. We know that. The absurdity of all of this is really taking hold, and it's time for us to open this government. This can be resolved quickly, Mr. President. Let's just get this government open, and then let's sit down and negotiate all of this. With that, I yield back to my friend from Maine. Thank you, and thank you for taking the time to share those stories with us. It's, it's so important that everybody understand the impact this is having in, in many areas that most people don't know anything about. I'm happy to uh, yield whatever time she'd like to the gentlewoman from Minnesota, Ms. McCollum. For, uh, Maine from organizing this. Madam Speaker, right now millions of Americans all across this country are struggling and they're uncertain about the future because of a government shutdown. Federal employees, government contractors, and their families, they are all hurting. Small businesses, nonprofits, state, local governments, they are feeling the pain. And they know they cannot count on Congress and the federal government as a reliable partner. So who's at fault for this responsible, negligent, and dangerous shutdown? President Trump and the Republicans. They're demanding a wall, a wall the Republican majority refused to fund for two years. And they're willing to inflict pain on millions of Americans, damage our economy, and put our nation at risk to get their way, all so the president can keep a campaign promise. Mr. Trump and the Republicans in Congress have taken 800,000 federal workers hostage and ransom, their demand for ransom for them is to get back to work. Well, if they want to get back to work and get paid, the ransom is Trump's wall. Last week, I met with over 40 federal employees, air traffic controllers, TSA agents, prison guards, all forced to work without pay. I met with federal workers from HUD and the IRS and the Agriculture Department who are furloughed and without pay. They are struggling. They feel betrayed by their government. They feel betrayed by their president. Tomorrow, these valued workers will miss their second paycheck. They're hurting. They feel desperate. Their families are hurting, and they feel afraid. They are being treated like pawns by this president and it's just outright cruel. House Democrats have passed appropriation bills 10 times to fund and immediately open the government, 
but Republicans keep voting no. It's time for Congress and Democrats to vote to open the government and to end this shutdown. Then we can negotiate the details of a comprehensive border security and immigration reform with the government open. Every federal worker on the job or at home, I want you to know you are valued for your service and your contribution to the safety and security and to the success of our nation. You deserve to be treated with respect. You deserve to get paid immediately. And the one way that we can collectively thank them for their service is to open the government now. And I yield back to the gentlewoman from Maine and thank her again for the time. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing those stories. Um, Mr. Perlmutter, did you? Well, if the gentlelady would yield. I'm happy to yield I have more uh, time. Uh, yeah, I want to talk about uh, Tom, who is a 32-year federal employee, works as an agricultural statistician. He calculates how many cattle are in the western United States and how many uh, acres of, of hay and crop that we have. This is his fourth government shutdown. He loves his job and his, and his work. He loves serving our country, but feels like these political games have become an insult, and he is tired of being used as a pawn. I have uh, many more stories, but I see that the gentleman from Maryland is uh, ready to go, and I'd yield back to the gentlelady from Maine so that she can yield to the gentleman from Maryland. Well, thank you very much, and thank you uh, to everyone here tonight to provide the diversity of stories that are really coming from states across the country, which we all represent. And I know it's just a small bit of what we're all hearing every day in our offices. So I'm pleased to yield time to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin. Thank Ms. You Pingree, thank here. you so much for your leadership. Mr. Perlmutter, thank you for your leadership. And I welcome all questions from you guys and any other colleagues here and from any uh, Republicans present, anybody wants to pose a question to me, I, I'm all for it. Um, uh, Madam Speaker, um, Laura Trump, who's President Trump's daughter-in-law and re-election campaign advisor, recently had a message for the furloughed workers and people working without pay. It'll all be worth it, she assures us. Quote, listen, it's not fair to you, and we all get this, but this is so much bigger than any one person, she said in an interview with Bold TV. It's a little bit of pain, but it's going to be for the future of our country. No, this is not a little bit of pain. A little bit of pain is losing your earring at the White House Christmas party. That's a little bit of pain. This is a lot of pain that the American people are experiencing right now. It's day 34 and tens of thousands of my constituents are suffering because of the shutdown. Military veteran air traffic controllers in Frederick County being forced to work with no pay and having to borrow money from their kids' 529 college accounts with the 10% penalty in order to put food on the table and to pay their mortgage. FDA workers living in Bethesda sent home from the job with no pay when they're supposed to be keeping our food supply safe from E. coli, salmonella, and insect infestation. Dozens of scientists, researchers, secretaries, technicians, park rangers, IT workers all thrust into a nightmare of closed offices, closed daycare, no gross pay, no net pay, and a suffering economy. There are thousands of private contract employees in my district, Madam Speaker, who've not earned a dollar in a month, and they're never going to get repaid for it. There are Uber drivers telling me they're making one-third of what they usually make because our regional economy is depressed in Maryland, Virginia, and D.C. because of the government shut down. And we know that that's symptomatic of what's going on across the country because more than 80 percent of federal workers don't live in the national capital region. One of my constituents has been a federal employee for 27 years, first in the Interior Department and then, the, and then in the National Park Service, who says, this is the first time that I've had to question whether I made the right choice in public service. And the first time I've had to reach into my retirement funds to make sure that my wife and I can pay our bills as they come due this week and next. He describes fellow Park Service employees living lives of quiet desperation. And of course they would be, because they're being maligned and typecast by the President of the United States, who derides all of the federal workers as Democrats. He says they're all Democrats. 
Well, first of all, it's not true. But what difference does it make? They are Americans. We used to have presidents of the United States who stood with all Americans, not with those from a particular political party, not just with those who agreed with the president or showed blind loyalty to the president. We used to have presidents who were loyal to the American people and to our Constitution. All are suffering, my constituent writes, mostly silently, not looking for pity, but just for Congress and the White House to do their job. Now, we might think this shutdown is some kind of freak outburst by an admittedly erratic and impetuous president. But Madam Speaker, I represent tens of thousands of federal workers, and I'm afraid that there's a method to this madness, and I know what it is. Because I was there in January 2017 when the president issued an executive order freezing all federal hiring, demoralizing, and even crippling agencies throughout our government. I was there when they adopted in January of 2017 the Holman Rule, giving Congress the power to reduce federal worker salaries and even abolish their, their positions simply by slipping riders into appropriations bills. I watched them try to ban the use of the words climate change by federal scientists in official documents, and I saw them propose hundreds of billions of dollars in cuts to federal worker wages and health benefits. I saw the president in September of last year announce his decision to rescind modest across the board statutory pay increases and locality pay increases of 1.9% for the federal workforce, and I've watched them try to bust the federal worker unions by making it easier to fire federal employees and trying to undo the existing collective bargaining contracts, a series of moves that were fought by the AFGE and NTEU and were finally reversed in court. Madam Speaker, the original political philosopher of this administration, Steve Bannon, told us very clearly what was the principal and overriding political aim of this administration when he essentially declared war on our government and its workforce. He stated at the outset of the administration that the new administration is in an unending battle for deconstruction of the administrative state. Every day it is going to be a fight, he said. And by the administrative state, he means my constituents who are working to protect our air, protect our water, protect our planet and the climate at the EPA, at NOAA, and throughout the federal government. He means the civil servants at the Department of Justice who are prosecuting mobsters and white-collar criminals, the IRS agents who are trying to catch tax scoff laws and collect money so we have a government. He means the people at NOAA who are trying to save us from the horrors of ocean acidification, the collapse of the glaciers, and the cataclysmic of weather events that have overtaken us in the age of global warming. He means the hardworking scientists and researchers at the NIH who are working to cure colon cancer and breast cancer, cystic fibrosis and multiple sclerosis, and even malignant narcissistic personality disorder. <laughs> Madam Speaker, does America recognize what's happening to us? We have a president who has essentially declared war on our own government, on our own civil service. This is a complete betrayal of the oath of office. He is sworn to, up and, to uphold and defend the law, not to frustrate and thwart it. The first paragraph of the Constitution creates a covenant to form a more perfect union. But the president has given us the longest shutdown in American history. He's driving a wedge through the union to establish justice. But they've defunded the Department of Justice to ensure domestic tranquility. But the Department of Homeland Security is not being funded, and our border and patrol agents are being forced to work with no pay to provide for the common defense. But our Coast Guard, Coast Guard officers have been held hostage along with the rest of the federal workforce to promote the general welfare. But 800,000 federal workers are being forced to work with no pay or sent home from jobs that the American people desperately want them to do. And to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, but instead, we are now threatening to bequeath to our children a dysfunctional government, degraded regulatory capacity to clean our air and water, a chaotic and unequal economy, and a comprehensive climate disaster. And who wins? Who benefits? Who profits from it? Well, we know it's not the American people. The overwhelming number of American people in every poll say, open up the government right now. Put the federal workers back to work. And it's not the federal workforce, which has been put through hell over the last month. It's not the business community, which is suffering. It's none of us who's benefiting, because the whole economy is hurting. But Donald Trump has a profound admiration 
for autocrats and kleptocrats, tyrants and dictators all over the world, Putin in Russia, Orban in Hungary, Duterte in the Philippines, the homicidal crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman. All of these are the heroes of the president. And it must be a delicious sight for them to see as the president dismantles the government of our own country. They don't shut down the government in Russia. They're not shutting down the government in Hungary. They're not shutting down the government in the Philippines. But he has shut down our own government. Who wins? Who benefits from this outrageous and scandalous offense against America? Well, it's not a partisan issue. I think the American people are increasingly unified every day against this horror. And now we have the first great Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, who unified America by working to save the Union and defend the government. And now we've got a Republican president who's driving a wedge through the Union and has closed the government down. Will that be his legacy? Will this disgraceful offense against our Constitution and government be the legacy of this president? Or will somehow someone get to the president and tell him that our people are hurting? It's not a little bit of pain. And I know they can't understand why federal workers are going to food banks. Then they should come on out to the food banks. I invite them to come join me at the food banks in my district where I've been going. You will meet lots of federal workers and their families there. Because in this economy, there are a lot of people who are living from paycheck to paycheck. And tomorrow, that's two paychecks that people have missed. And they've missed them in the course of not doing the jobs that America needs them to do. So I want to thank Ms. Pinkery for yielding this time. And I just urge all of our colleagues on both sides of the aisle and the president to please let America get back to work and to open the government immediately. I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Maryland. And I know it's particularly challenging in a district where so many people are close to Washington and so many federal employees have you know, a multitude of challenges. So I appreciate your good work and your thoughts. And I want to yield a little time to my friend and colleague from uh, Alabama, uh, Ms. Sewell. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I rise today in solidarity with the over 800,000 federal workers and contractors who are dramatically impacted by the shameful and irresponsible government shutdown. I rise today to share the stories of those federal workers in my district, Alabama's 7th Congressional District. This shutdown is impacting everyone. I had the pleasure recently of going through the Montgomery Airport and the, and the, and the Birmingham Airport in my district. Uh, you know, it was Martin Luther King's day and everybody was trying to be upbeat. But you know, it is really hard to be upbeat when you miss a paycheck. It's hard to be upbeat when you have bills to pay and you don't know how you're gonna make ends meet. We celebrated Martin Luther King's birthday on Monday. Uh, and it was King who said that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Well, Madam Speaker, it is a threat to justice that people work without pay in this country, in America. It is an injustice that they are about to miss the second paycheck. It is unacceptable that we are not doing our job so that the people who are working without pay can get paid. We have to do better. We must reopen government. Enough is truly enough. Today, my staff delivered food to the Federal Bureau of Prisons in Aliceville, Alabama, in Pickens County, to the more hundreds of workers that work there every day and who have not gotten paid in 35 days. They did so out of service. But you know what? We, out of obligation, must open up this government so that Everyone who is working gets paid, and all those that are furloughed can go back to work. We know the importance of dignity of a job, and these are hardworking federal workers and contractors that deserve to get paid. Why are we holding them hostage? Why is their paychecks held hostage? All for a wall. I want to be clear, Madam Speaker. We Democrats believe in border security, but we want effective border security. 
I do not believe that spending $5.7 billion for a wall when people in my district, babies in my district, go to bed hungry. When there are people in my district who need basic water and sewer in Lowndes County and in Pickens County and in Perry County, Alabama, I will stand up and fight for all those in my district. And I stand in solidarity with my federal workers and contractors. They deserve to get paid. I had an opportunity to talk with a young TSA worker from Birmingham, Alabama, just on Tuesday. I pass through that airport once a week, coming to and fro to DC. And this young worker with a smile on her face said, how are you this morning? Can I help you? And I said, how can I help you? I want you to know that we're working hard every day to open up government. She goes, I know that. I know that you are. I also know that you know that a wall will not make the difference. You know, the, the sad irony is that so many of these federal workers don't have savings. She told me that she was just happy to have a job with the federal government. To have the security of having a federal job is what she said. She also told me that right now things are okay because she has her mother to take care of her child. She can no longer afford to send her child to daycare and put gas in her car to drive to the Birmingham airport to work at 4 a.m. in the morning, that first shift. But she does it. She does it as long as she can. And we have to stand on this floor and demand that we reopen government as long as we can, as long as they have not gotten their paychecks. It's unfair. It is an injustice. It is an injustice. So today, many of my, my uh, congressional staff are with those correctional officers in Aliceville, Alabama. We heard the story of Heather Bryant, who is struggling to pay for the gas she needs to drive the 30 minutes to work. You see, in this small community of Aliceville, Alabama, the Federal Women's Correctional Facility is the major employer. It is the major employer in that city, in that county. And I want you to know that because of the 35 days that these correction officers, parole officers, prison workers have gone without pay, that we have seen restaurants close. We have seen convenience stores reduce hours in that community. Indeed, in order for us to provide meals today, we had to reopen that meat and three diner in order to feed these workers today. This is unacceptable because it's not just the federal workers that are impacted. It's a collateral damage that's done to the communities around this country. Store owners, restaurant owners who depend upon those workers for their livelihoods are affected. We must do something now. It is unfair for us to ask those folks who are furloughed to come back to work and not get paid. It is unfair and unjust for us to ask federal workers who are working hard every day in our airports, in our prison systems, all across this nation to work without pay. But as, as Martin Luther King also said, the time is always right to do what is right. And what is right, Madam Speaker, is to reopen government now. We must stand with these federal workers. We must unabashedly demand that they get paid. And we must seek ways to work across the aisle to get government open. But they have to also offer an olive branch. This president hasn't done that. Instead, he's put his interests over the American people's interests. Enough is enough. We must reopen government and let our federal workers, our contractors, know that we stand in solidarity with them. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much to uh, Ms. Sewell from Alabama. Happy to give uh, whatever time she would like to Ms. Schakowsky from Illinois. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to come, and, come down and talk. Um, our uh, colleague from Alabama was talking about Martin Luther King, who also talked about the urgency of now. If there's a time for urgency, it is now to end the shutdown and pay the, and pay the workers. He also talked about and warned about 
that if you wait too long, it can be too late. So this is the time to spare what is a growing disaster for all Americans from, from, from happening. Wilbur Ross, our Commerce Secretary, said that he doesn't quite understand why these furloughed and unpaid workers might have to go to a food bank. He doesn't understand. That is exemplary of the level at which this administration is completely tone deaf and out of touch. That they don't understand how people, the, the beginning salary for a TSA worker at the airport is $28,000. And sometimes it goes up to maybe $43,000. Tomorrow will be the second week, the second paycheck that they don't get. So um, a number of us in, in Chicago had a round table um, that included eight members of the House of Representatives, Democrats, and Senator Durbin, um, Madam Chair right now, um, Madam Speaker in the chair, was at that, uh, that round table. And we heard from 18 different workers from different agencies um, talking. And Wilbur Ross ought to talk to Florence, who is helping people get food stamps and found herself having to apply for food stamps for the SNAP program. And she waited three hours at a food bank. Why? Because the lines are growing and growing and growing of people who, yes, Secretary Ross, need to get food on their tables and can't afford to do it. Shame on you for not understanding what's going on out there. Um, we are hearing people giving blood and plasma in order to have a few dollars to put food on the, uh, uh, on the table. Uh, we're hearing about people running out of gas money, because, and, and that means that they can't get to work. This is money that comes out of their pocket while they are not getting paychecks. This president... Mitch McConnell, who won't even, uh, you know, doesn't want to call bills that would actually get the government going. Shame on you. Shame on you, Wilbur Ross. Shame on this administration. This is a crisis. This is a disaster that you're creating. You can end it. So the, the demand is clear. And the shutdown, pay the workers. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you for hosting a roundtable in your district. I think every, every time we get a chance to have people gather to talk about this, at least they know we're listening to them even if we haven't fixed the problem. I'm happy to yield whatever time he would like to use to Mr. Soto from Florida. Thank you. And thank you, I thank the gentlelady from Maine for hosting this. Uh, first, I want to start by reading a letter uh, from one of my constituents, Douglas Lowe, who is a professional aviation safety specialist in my district. Dear Representative Soto, I am writing you with a heavy heart and much stress as I live through this government shutdown. It has been the longest we have ever faced, and as the days continue, I am finding myself more and more weakened by the situation. I am president for the Florida chapter of professional aviation safety specialists. We represent the men and women that make aviation across our nation function in every aspect, from the aviation safety inspectors to people like myself who maintain complex equipment that makes air traffic control possible, as well as a multitude of support staff that deal with logistics and contracts. The main reason I am writing you is to talk about the human factor. We need to find a resolution. There must be an end to this shutdown. Real people are suffering. Many coworkers of mine across the nation, people I represent, have come to me with hardships. I personally have dealt with two individuals already whom have had to resign their positions and move on with life. We are going on day 34 now with no end in sight. Men and women like myself have still been at work. Each day makes that endeavor a little harder. We struggle with when and how do we keep coming to work? 
and support the system that we can no longer afford gas to get to. I personally have had to make some sacrifices already. This Friday, the 25th, is my daughter's 18th birthday. I've asked my daughter to please forgive me, but we are not buying her anything right now because we need to budget and ensure we have money for bills and for food. I also take care of my mother who has schizophrenia. I have been relying 100% this past month on her nurse to hold everything together because I cannot get over to see her. The amount of stress and anxiety surrounding these events is enormous. I cannot ask enough that every member of Congress please think about those of us caught in the middle of this fight. Please consider our hardships and find some common ground. Find a road forward. I still have faith in you, and we are carrying the country on our backs, but I do not know how much longer we can endure. I'm a Marine and a leader, so I show a smile, and I keep moving forward, but I've already seen the heartache and turmoil others have displayed. People crying, not knowing how to make ends meet. Professionals applying for food stamps and aid while still being required to put in 40-hour work weeks. The list goes on and on. But I believe the most disturbing fact is that this is happening to people in the United States of America, the greatest country in the world. People are being asked and forced to work for free, threatened to completely lose their livelihood if they do not show up for work. This is something that I would expect from a from a country that is developing. I won't use the exact word he used. My fear is someone is going to be so stressed that they misc a task. They're going to be so fatigued that they make a mistake. And with the jobs that we do, that mistake could lead to the lives of thousands being lost. Aviation safety is on the line. And each day, each hour, each minute, that we stay shut down, more risk is injected into our nation's aviation system. Please, I beg you to reopen the government before something bad happens. I continue to come to work because I think of the children that may be flying into Orlando on a Make-A-Wish Foundation flight. That child may have cancer and may be on their way to Disney for what may be the last days of their lives. I come to work each day without pay to make sure that those children land safely. But as the weeks turn into months for this shutdown, I am fearful that even I will have a breaking point. Sincerely, Douglas Lowe, professional aviation safety specialist. Now I want to talk a little bit about compromise throughout American history. You know, there have been some great American compromises that we have seen in this nation. Starting at the very founding of our republic in, eight, in 1787, after we had to start working on the Constitution, Connecticut delegates Roger Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth drafted the Great Compromise, a plan for congressional representation. Without this, there likely would have never been a constitution. Many more compromises have followed in political history, but imagine what small states would face if, and large states would face if they didn't have representation in the Senate and in the House. And then there was the Compromise of 1790 that was made famous by the now popular Hamilton musical. It was the compromise by Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Je Jefferson with James Madison where Hamilton won the decision for the national government to take over and pay the debt and create a banking system while Jefferson and Madison obtained a national capital in the District of Columbia that we stand in right now for the South. That was described as the room where it happens. And I feel like we need another room where it happens today. But compromises aren't always great in American history. 
the 19th century <coughs> in particular, we had many examples, and it was a dark time for trying to compromise on such moral crusades, such as slavery in the Civil War. But I will mention one of them. In 1820, there was the Missouri Compromise, legislation that provided admission of your state, Maine, a free state, along with Missouri, that unfortunately came in as a slave state, thus maintaining the balance of power between the North and the South in the United States. So one of the things I struggle with right now is what time are we in? Is this a time where we need to compromise and it'll turn out to be one of those terrible ones that America will look back on, like that one? Or will it be one of the ones that helped forge ahead the republic stronger than ever? In the 20th century, compromise fail, fared far better in American politics. We saw in 1917, the United States came together to enter World War I, even though we were still emerging as a world power ourselves. But we saved our allies from destruction and turned the tide of the war and eventually emerged as a major power. But everything changed when we saw the New Deal happen. And mostly Democrats, with some Republicans, not enough of them, came together to help make sure that we would have major programs to help put Americans back to work after we had the stock market crash. But it was in December 7, 1941, in a day that would live in infamy, where Pearl Harbor was bombed, that Democrats and Republicans came together to join in a fight against Nazi Germany and the Japanese Empire to literally rewrite the rules of the world order that we now live in today. We just, in fact, reaffirmed those with a vote the other day, affirming our support for NATO. Compromises got even better as we got into the 60s. In 1964, one of the first civil rights bills was proposed by congressional Democrats in the North and opposed by Republican senators and led to one of the longest filibusters in Senate history. Eventually, Majority Leader Hubert Humphrey of Minnesota, I believe, reached out to his Republican counterpart, Senator Everett Dirksen, to put an end to the debate, and the, pill, the bill passed nine, years, nine days later. In 1977, we saw finally more regulations and more teeth into the law to protect uh, folks who were going hungry with the Food Stamp Act. And it was Republican Bob Dole at the time. I mean, can you imagine that later on? Along with Democrat, Democratic Senator George McGovern that joined forces to support a bipartisan compromise back in 1977. In 86... We've heard so much about in the 80s, President Reagan and Speaker Tip O'Neill being able to get together to come up with major compromises. One was to save Social Security for a future generation in 1983 to 86. Another in 86 was a tax reform bill that eventually came to a compromise, which leads me to the, probably the most relevant one for what we have today, which is in 2013, when a bipartisan immigration bill passed the Senate with 68 votes. It had comprehensive immigration reform and included robust border security. So the big question that each member will have to ask in the Congress, in the House, in the Senate, and among the President as well, is what are we willing to do to rise together? What sacrifices are we willing to take and what compromises are we willing to wage? And what interests are we going to advance to come together to put an end to the longest shutdown in American history? And I can assure you it's not going to be easy. But I know that if we all work together, we can do it. But there's one thing in common with all these compromises. None of them required a government shutdown. Not a single one. We had some filibusters in there. But not one 
of these major compromises in American history started by a shutdown. So I think the first thing that we need to do is reopen the government, not hold our federal workers hostage over what needs to be a grand compromise on policy, on immigration, on border security. And with that, I thank the gentleman from Maine for allowing me to have a few moments to talk about how important it is this moment in time is and how every member needs to step up for the American people to end this shutdown now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I thank the gentleman from Florida and for uh, reminding us of so many important historic compromises. Some I liked, some I didn't, but uh, were it not for Missouri Compromise, we wouldn't have Maine, so I'm glad about that one anyway. Um, and also, as you said, um, we can compromise without holding all of these workers who we've been talking about tonight hostage and uh, without shutting down the government, without shaking up people's lives. This is our challenge to work out. Um, as members of Congress, as members of the executive branch, we can't ask our hardworking federal employees to bear the brunt of all of this. And uh, with that, I'd like to yield some time to the woman from, the gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Clark, who's also the vice chair of our caucus. And thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for fitting us in your busy schedule. Thank you. Uh, thank you for yielding and for holding this um, important special order hour. Uh, it is so important that we tell the stories of the very real impact of this shutdown, and I appreciate you giving us that opportunity. I do want to share some of the stories from my district. Uh, we recently heard from Emily, who's a TSA agent at Logan Airport and a single mom of three. She hasn't received her paycheck. She won't be getting one tomorrow and is worried about falling behind on rent and childcare payments. She has to stay current with childcare or she loses her children's spots. She said, quote, I don't know how I'm going to make this work. If I don't get paid, how can I afford to send my children to daycare? She has $400 left in her bank account. Then there's Donna from Revere. She's been employed at her job for the last 22 years, but doesn't know where her next meal will come from without a paycheck to rely on. Donna said, I have to choose between buying food or paying a bill. We received a call from a retired federal employee in Natick. She lives in affordable housing and is required to prove her income to renew her lease. She cannot obtain a statement from OPM regarding her pension because they are closed, jeopardizing her living situation. Sandy called us. She owns a startup in Cambridge that almost exclusively contracts with DOD and DHS. This is a small business and they are struggling to keep up with payroll as the checks stopped coming. She said, we have about a week and a half of payroll left. David from Ashland is an active duty Coast Guard member stationed in Boston, which I want to note, uh, community has come together to open a food bank for our Coast Guard members and their families. And he doesn't know how he and his family are going to continue to pay their bills. The Coast Guard, uh, certainly for coastal states and for our national security, play a critical role, not only in search and rescue, uh, protection from terrorism, but also in drug interdiction. And the fact that we are asking Coast Guard members who serve their country proudly and with great patriotism to work without pay is a national shame. Susan from Belmont receives a housing subsidy through HUD, and if the shutdown continues, she is afraid she could face the possibility of eviction. We've heard from Amanda in Waltham. Amanda is an Indian citizen who's resided with legal status in the U.S. for over 12 years, working for a child care provider. She and her husband and young son traveled to India in November to visit with family. And at that time, they went to the U.S. consulate to get their visas stamped. Her husband's visa was issued right away, but Amanda's was subject to further review. 
Having not received her visa, she remains in India, separated from her son and husband. The shutdown has delayed this processing further and has prolonged the separation, which is a significant hardship on this family. These are just a few of the stories that we have heard about what is the real impact on this shutdown. It is long past time that we open government. We can negotiate on what real border security looks for, but it shouldn't be done at the expense of the security of these families and of our national security as well. Thank you very much. I thank the gentlewoman from Massachusetts for sharing those stories, um, which we are hearing throughout New England and are so um, challenging and meaningful to all of us. We've heard tonight from, uh, as I said earlier, we have heard from all regions of the country, north and south and east and west, and so many of these stories are the same. We've heard from families affected by the fact that our Coast Guard, uh, our Coast Guard uh, personnel are not being paid. The only branch of the military that doesn't get paid, and this is a hardship, not only on them, but on their families as well, who are home trying to make ends meet when they're off deployed. The TSA, the FAA, which we depend on uh, every single day in our airports across the country for our safety, for our security, um, people who work in the federal courts, people who are not working, uh, but are government employees. They're not essential, so they're furloughed, but they can't go out and get another job in the middle of all this. They just have to wait till it's over to collect that back pay. And so many of the contractors I hear from who can continue with the contracts because maybe they work with the Coast Guard or other federal agencies and they can't um, keep the funding going and they can't give any certainty to when jobs will be completed or to their own employees. I have a couple of minutes left and I'm gonna read a, a long story, but uh, it might just take up just exactly the amount of time. We talk so much about all of the employees, but there are so many others who are impacted by this and particularly in the agriculture sector in Maine. We're very proud of our farmers. We're very proud of, of seeing new young farmers um, getting into the business of farms being revived and finding new markets. Um, and this was a story from the Grace Pond Farm in Thomaston. They shared their story of how the USDA shutdown has impacted them. They said, uh, we are often a little removed from the issues affecting others. We can sigh and rejoice, cry and shake our, fist, shake our fist in the air with just a little bit of safe distance from way up here, but not this time. This shutdown affects everyone and that everyone includes us. We've planned and schemed and dreamed our way into this historic farm property in Thomaston. Greg and I um, have spent our countless late nights after catching chickens and milking cows, staring at screens and numbers, putting together business plans and spreadsheets to grow sustainably. Our goal is just to be able to milk cows, grow chickens and turkeys, feed our kids and neighbors, and drive a car that runs. Greg grew up learning how to enjoy dark mornings working on a dairy farm in rural Pennsylvania and I grew up in central Maine spending mornings waiting for the Skiens dairy truck and learning how to beat my brother to the cream on the top of that glass bottle. We want to ensure that both of these experiences are available to our kids and to everyone in Maine for years to come. Our farm is financed in the old-fashioned way on a tightrope. We operate on a faith-based budget that keeps things very exciting. The FSA and USDA Rural Development Loans are valuable resources for poor folks that want to work hard and eat well, and we make good use of them. About a year ago, with shifting dairy market impacting our current situation, we poured ourselves into the process of financing a new farm we'd found to fit our needs. Utilizing a community lender, we managed to secure that property, and relying on our faith-based budget, we went for it. Thanks to CEI for taking that chance on us. We also begin the laborious process of financing the dairy infrastructure at the new property using FSA as our security lender because that's what they do for us. This is all contingent on our selling the old farm property. We cannot in any way carry two farms. After gratefully securing a buyer for the old farm, we were moments away from closing when the government was shut down. Just like that. We lost access to our mortgage holder and all of the necessary documentation and signatures that they alone can provide. Not only that, we were just a few weeks away from the deadline for our main DACF-based dairy loan and found ourselves suddenly without the proof of security necessary. No skin in the game equals no dairy loan. We are now weeks past our closing. 
We continue to accrue heating bills, taxes, and mortgage interest on the old farm property while we pay all the same on the new one. We had to scramble to find another bridge loan for the dairy infrastructure, and due to the lender being anyone but the USDA, interest rate is more than five percentage points higher. That translate into an annual number that made our numbers guy take a few breaths before commenting when he hears the news. We are thousands of dollars into this shutdown now. We operate on razor thin margins. We're not alone. The companies that sell us grain and chicks and poults, sorry, gotta stop that timer. Poults are actual people, employing other actual people, all operating on a faith based budget, trying to preserve a way of life that we believe. We need an end to the shutdown before we have to shut down the way of life that should be much more and is lost for all. Thank you so much to all my colleagues for being here tonight. Thank you to everyone who shared their stories and allowed us to let you in on a little bit of how this uh, tragedy proceeds. And I encourage uh, time a expired. negotiation and a settlement. Thank you and I yield back. Members are reminded to refrain from engaging in personalities towards the president. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 3rd, 2019, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Grothman, for 30 minutes. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to address the current government shutdown and the status of the government wall. Um, it's kind of a frustrating issue to address because there's so much misinformation out there. The first thing I will address is the unpaid employees. We can pay the unpaid employees, particularly the employees who are working, if we would pass a bill now. We do not have to end this whole thing. There is a wonderful bill, House Bill 271, introduced by uh, Congressman Brooks, I'm a co-sponsor, that will immediately pay all the current working federal employees. I do not have the power to put that bill on the floor because I am just a regular congressman from Wisconsin. But the majority leader, if you see him, could put that bill on the floor any time. And if the real concern here is for the federal employees who work in our airports, who work in the Coast Guard, who work in our prisons, many of which I know and are great people, if these people really cared about them, that bill would be on the floor next Tuesday and winging its way to President Trump's desk by this time next week. It is a mystery to me why, when so many politicians purport to care about the federal employees, they will not bring forth this bill to pay them without having the whole issue solved. The next issue I'm going to address is these people who say President Trump cannot compromise. I don't know whether they haven't been paying attention the last two years or whether they are just love to make things up. To, for the public to understand, under normal circumstances, if we're going to build a wall, the wall is in what we call an appropriation bill, or people back home would refer to as a budget. President Trump ran on the wall, and the wall is necessary, and we'll talk about that in a second. But nevertheless, President Trump would have wanted funding for this wall in some budget. For this first two years, President Trump was sent budgets by Congress or spending bills by Congress that did not contain a wall. That was frustrating to him, but because, it, because he did not want to shut down the, gov the government, he did not want to penalize the government employees, President Trump, particularly with a big omnibus bill uh, about a year ago, signed big spending bills without a wall because he compromised. You will recall that originally people talked about this wall being two, uh, $20 billion. President Trump is now asking for $5.7 billion. In the last week, I have taken time to meet with the former head of the Border Patrol. I have been on the Arizona border, and it disappoints the experts in the field, the people on the border themselves, that Donald Trump has compromised so much as to want only funding for a fraction of the wall. So I would say coming down from $20 billion 
to $5.7 billion is a big compromise. I would say twice signing entire appropriations for his first two years in office without the